Good afternoon and welcome to this presentation of the Venice Declaration. Uh, I am Ignacio Socias, Director of International Relations of the International Federation for Family Development. And we are very happy to be part of this event today, together with the permanent mission of Ecuador to the United Nations, the government of Malaysia, the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, in particular the Division for Inclusive Social Development, as it is called now, UN Habitat, and also we are very glad to count on the participation of the Veneto region, the Ellison European Social Network, the French Department, the Bouche du Rhône, the community of Attica in Greece, and also the Comunidad de Madrid in Spain. Um, this is going to be a, a very special uh, event because things we want things to be different from now on from today. And I think that no one better than the speaker I'm going to introduce can talk to you about this. Permítanme, por favor, que les presente a la representante permanente adjunta del Ecuador en las Naciones Unidas, eh, su excelencia Elena Llanez, a la que pido que nos dirija las palabras iniciales y que valore ella mejor que nadie lo que estamos haciendo hoy. Tiene la palabra, excelencia. Muchas gracias, Muchas gracias Ignacio. Uh, good afternoon, distinguished panelists, moderator, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this important event, which Ecuador has the privilege to co-sponsor to observe the World Cities Day and recognize the role of family and family policies to actively contribute to making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable, as stated in Sustainable Development Goal 11. We would like also to thank the Permanent Mission of Malaysia as well as UN Habitat, DESA, the representative of local governments and civil society here present, in particular the International Federation for Family Development, for joining their efforts and contribute to the realization of this panel discussion. As you are aware, Ecuador had the honor to host the Habitat Tree Conference in Quito in October 2016, which set a milestone not only because it adopted the new urban agenda, but also due to the number and diversity of participants. National, subnational, and local governments were present, as well as civil society, indigenous people, and local communities, the private sector, professionals, and academics. More than 3,000 participants came from 167 countries, constituting the largest participation in the history of the United Nations conferences. I would like also underscore something that's sometimes is overlooked. The new urban agenda, and now with the hints that I'm able to, to say it, such a, such a scope is in such a manner cross-cutting that in fact, if we are able to apply the new urban agenda, we are contributing to all the SDGs because all the, L, all, all, all the SDGs are linked, but since uh, urbanization is a phenomenon so important and, and rapid in our daily lives. You need to contribute in, to the new urban agenda, and at the same time, you are contribut contributing to all, all, all the other SDGs. For my country, the realization of the right to the city is at the core of the new urban agenda, since Article 31 of the Ecuadorian Constitution states accordingly that people have the right to full enjoyment of the city and public spaces under the principles of sustainability, social justice, respect for the diverse cultural urban expressions, and balance between rural and urban backgrounds through the promotion of particip participatory processes and the full exercise of freedoms and human rights. This is the reason why we were pleased by recognition in the new urban agenda of a shared vision of cities for all, for the equal use and enjoyment of cities and human settlements. 
with a view to promote inclusiveness and ensure that all inhabitants without discrimination are able to inhabit and produce just, safe, healthy, accessible, affordable, resilient, and sustainable cities to foster prosperity and quality of life for all. Furthermore, signatories of the new urban agenda committed themselves to promote equitable and affordable access to basic physical and social infrastructure for all, including affordable housing, modern and renewable energy, safe drinking water and sanitation, nutritious food, sustainable mobility, healthcare and family planning, education, culture and information, and communication technologies, among others, that have been appropriately included in the Venice Declaration. That's the importance of the new urban agenda and this event. Member states further committing themselves to ensure that these services are responsive to the rights and needs of all family members, women, children, and youth, older persons, persons with disabilities, migrants, indigenous peoples, and those in vulnerable situations. Ecuador has been working with diligence to enhance the implementation of the new urban agenda and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development through policies and programs that benefit all Ecuadorian families, and I would like to provide just a few examples. The National Assembly issued the Organic Law for Labor, Justice, and Recognition of Work in the Home, establishing the right to social security affiliation of persons who perform household and paid work that means housewife or house husbands. Likewise, the Ecuadorian Social Security Institute extended health coverage to relative of members and retirees, including spouses or partners and children under 18 years of age. The National Assembly also approved the organic law for the promotion of youth work, exceptional regulation of working hours, unemployment and unemployment insurance that encouraged the care of children to be extended and shared and share between working parents by establishing that the father or the mother, upon conclusion or of the maternity or paternity leave, are entitled to an optional and voluntary leave without remuneration for up to nine additional months within the first 12 months of the child's life. Likewise, the Ministry of Economic and Social Inclusion has implemented a strategy of confirmation, operation, and a strengthening of committees of people who care for people with disabilities. The project empowers and strengthens the role of family caregivers through the creation of spaces for the improvement of personal skills, recreation, and social participation. These and other initiatives aim to consolidate and revitalize effective public policies that are fundamental to eradicate poverty, combat growing inequality, and social and economic exclusion, as well as the spatial segregation in cities and human settlements. They support local governments in fulfilling their key role in strengthening the interface among all relevant stakeholders, offering opportunities for dialogue and participation from all segments of society. The new new urban agenda also recognizes that this implementation requires an enabling environment and a wide range of means, including access to science, technology, innovation, capacity development, and mobilization of financial resources, as well as enhance international cooperation and partnerships among governments at all levels, in particular with the United Nations system, the private sector and civil society, and other actors, based on the principles of equality, non-discrimination, accountability, respect for human rights and solidarity, especially with those who are the poorest and most vulnerable. Thus, the importance Ecuador gives to events such as today's in order to observe the World Cities Day and to gather with you to discuss how to achieve inclusive and resilient cities for sustainable families. We are confident in the everlasting legacy of the conference and the New Year agenda, as well as the value of creating, promoting, and enhancing open, friendly, and participatory spaces for dialogue and understanding. Thank you very much. Gracias, Ignacio. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I think this has been very enlightening to settle the, the scene where we want to really make this event run through. And now, also, uh, as an opening remark, we have the privilege to count 
not on Chris Williams because he was uh, he had some last minute problems, but also a very experienced person on the UN Habitat New York office, the Deputy Director Philippe Decor. You have the floor, Philippe. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the um, to you for organizing this, and, and, and very happy to be here with uh, with Ecuador and, uh, and Malaysia, uh, two member states very dear to us. Uh, and so very happy to be with you and, and always very happy to be in an event that brings together national level, local level governments with civil society. Uh, it's again, it's, 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 it's the perfect representation of what it takes to implement the new urban agenda, as you pointed out, uh, Excellency, and, uh, and ult ultimately also to, as you said, implementing the new urban agenda is the best way to accelerate towards achieving the SDGs. And, and allow me just to make some, um, some broad remarks uh, to, to, to come back to the topic of, of, of the day. And, and for us, um, we, we often tend to think sectorally. And we often tend to think in categories. We talk a lot about youth here in, uh, in New York. Uh, we increasingly talk, luckily enough, about, about our aging populations. But we very not often enough talk about the systems that keep everything together. And for us, just talking about the SDGs, we say if, you get, if we get our cities right, if we make them inclusive and resilient, we will be able to achieve a lot of the other SDGs. But it, it starts with planning and managing our cities. If we do that right, then a lot of the other SDGs will be much more easier. So the systems that are in place in the city that ties everything together, it exists at the city level, it exists at the neighborhood level, but it's that level underneath one of the key building blocks, the family, that exactly brings those different groups together, from the child to the youth to uh, uh, the breadwinners to the, to the people holding the family together uh, and to the elderly. And that understanding, that family unit, I think is extremely important because ultimately also it's very often at the family level that decisions are taken in terms of the, 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 the life they want for, their, for themselves, for the whole family, where do they live based on a whole set of considerations of access to education, access to affordable housing, uh, access to services, access to social networks, and that complex set of, of factors that surrounds them is the basis for them to take decisions. But it's, they take decisions. They take decisions on the kind of life, uh, life they want. Now, of course, as we've seen in the Sustainable Development Goals and as we see in our broader discussions, um, the sum of those decisions ultimately creates our environment, creates the kind of society we live in. And it's important to understand that correlation also because it's not just the sum of the individual decisions of a family, but also exactly what kind of society that gives us uh, in the end that hopefully is uh, going to be more sustainable, inclusive and resilient. So for us, uh, extremely happy to be, to be part of this event. Uh, very encouraged to see the, this kind of commitment to the issue by a whole range of, of, uh, of local, local and regional governments, and of course with the support of, of national entities. So uh, looking forward to the discussion, and, and apologies also on my behalf, because it's not only World Cities Day, we have important discussion on Inhabitants Resolution ongoing, and other floors, and we are, we are only three here in New York, so we am supposed to be in five places at this moment, and I, I chose to be here. Uh, so uh, thanks again for inviting us, and, and very, very supportive of your discussions. Thank you very much, Philippe, and we are very happy that you chose to be here because we know how much you value you and Habitat, and we do also with all your work. So now we come to the time of our keynote speech. I don't know if you'd like to speak from there or you prefer to stay there. But you... Yes, I, I can give you the... While I present you, no, but please come, come, and I'll, and I'll give you this. Yes, 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 yes. So, Professor Bahira Trask, as you, as you know, no, you, could, you can go there. You can oh, you go there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. I hope it works. Professor Bahira Trask, as you know, is professor and chair of the Department of Human Development and Family Sciences at the University of Delaware. I've known Bahira for quite a few years now, and I can tell you that her commitment with this topic goes far beyond what it she's going to speak today about. But I hope that at least you get some flavor, some ideas that will 
help you to learn more about her work. Thank you very much for being here, Bahira. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. First of all, I would like to thank all of you for coming. I'm amazed that there's such a large group, such a wonderful turnout that shows your commitment to this topic. I would really like to thank Mr. Ignacio Socias and Alex Velasquez for inviting me. We have worked together before and they are a real pleasure to work with. I would also like to in, uh, thank the, um, the uh, representatives from Ecuador and Malaysia for sponsoring the session. And the person who actually is behind me being up here is Ms. Renata Kazberska, because last winter she asked me to write a background paper for the Division for Social Policy and Development, which is actually on their website. It's a very long paper. It's 62 pages, single-spaced. So, you know, if you need something to do in your summer vacation, you can read it. But it is all, it is really about how we can implement successfully the SDGs and put family at the center because I really feel very strongly, like Ignacio said, that that is what's missing and that is the only way we are truly going to successfully implement these SDGs. Today I'm going to speak specifically about SDG 11 since it is the day of cities and I'm going to speak specifically about housing um, participation and a little bit about green spaces. I should warn you, my presentation's a little bit too long, so I'm going to skip through it, but I am happy to make my presentation available to you at any point. So, as you know, we're living in a unique time in human history because currently about 55% of the global population is living in urban areas, and this number is expected to grow. Historically, human beings always lived in agriculture, first in tribes and then in agricultural settings. So this, is, this has been really a turning point in human history. Also strikingly, 95% of this urban expansion is going to be taking place not in the West, but in developing countries. So currently, just to give you an overview, we have several what are called mega cities, cities with over 25 million people, and it is expected that by 2028, New Delhi is actually going to become the largest of these mega cities. Um, again, to give you a feeling of the distribution, in North America, about 82% of the uh, population lives in urban areas. And actually, this week, I was reading about American politics, and it turns out that about 70% of the American population lives in 17 states. So this issue of urbanization plays itself out sometimes in ways that are unexpected. Um, in Europe, as you can see, it's 72%, Asia 50%, and Africa 43%. But look at my last figures there, which is that India, China, and Nigeria will account for 35% of the growth in urbanization, just three countries. So. A lot of people talk about urbanization in a negative perspective. From my perspective, that's actually incorrect. It is just another development in the de evolution of human beings because urbanization gives us the opportunity to create more efficient systems and it allows us to link eco the economy with energy outputs and environment and social life, but it involves planning and it involves best case examples and learning from each other. Still, I would argue that the most important aspect to take into account for uh, in terms of urbanization is poverty, because that is the major obstacle to equal participation within cities and within states, and it, it, uh, poverty stands in the way of social inclusion because the poor are often marginalized and they are not part of the, the decision-making processes. Um, 
I just, I, again, I, the other day I heard a very interesting program on uh, one of our radio stations here in America, it's called NPR, and the man uh, was arguing that we are at the beginning of seeing the effects of climate change and the refugees. So what we're going to be seeing over the next 10 to 20 years is more and more individuals in all parts of the world migrating to urban areas and to er areas where they can earn a living. And so what is happening is that we have cities, but the cities, the people are not equally distributed within cities. A lot of poor people live particu particularly at the margin of urban centers, and thus they are socially excluded from the economic, political, and socio-cultural aspects of life in cities. Also, young children and older persons are often disadvantaged because they tend to be living away from the centers of power. We also have a division between what is going on in Western countries and in other parts of the world. For example, in Western countries, increasingly, cities are what are sometimes named uh, kitty deserts. What this means is that there are lots of single people and couples living in the city, but not children. And so what this leads to is there's lots of nice shops and restaurants and there's lots of things to do. But the people who are living in the city don't have a long-term social commitment to the well-being of the city. So again, regional, where you are located in the world matters in terms of urbanization. And there are some different issues going on in different parts of the world. So getting to the sort of crucial part of this is the role of families in urbanization. What we're seeing across the globe is a shrinking support by governments for services that families need. And so what is happening is that individuals, especially vulnerable individuals, young children, elderly persons, uh, persons with disabilities, uh, individuals who are ill, they need services, they're not getting as many services, and so they are actually more reliant on families today than they even were in the past. This is, of course, a little bit different in the North European countries, but we're certainly seeing it in other parts of the world, including in the United States. There's less support and there's pressure on governments not to provide all of these services that individuals need. So a very problematic piece of this, and uh, the gentleman who mentioned it, who introduced us, is that we tend to dis uh, disaggregate the conversation about needs of individuals. So we speak about children and early childhood. We talk about the issues of the booming youth population, of the booming uh, persons who are elderly, individuals with disabilities, but we don't recognize that they live in a unit. They live in family units, no matter how those units are defined. And I think this is very problematic because if we want to design services, we need to take account the holistic uh, the holistic group that people are living in. So what do families still do? Families have not, like I said, they, they have not decreased in importance. They have actually become more important in importance. We have a dialogue, and this is not to disparage in any form another discipline, but we have a dialogue that comes primarily out of psychology that puts the individual at the center of social life. But certainly in non-Western context, but I would argue also in Western, context, families still matter because of membership, uh, they provide basic economic support, they rear children, and they provide care for vulnerable people. In terms of urban context, gender also matters because particularly women are often the ones who have specific problems in urban areas. So if a woman can't, for example, get to a clinic easily, she may end up, when she's pregnant, she may end up having a problematic birth, having issues around uh, uh, disabilities, that sort of thing. Women need to be able to move around public spaces without being harassed and assaulted. 
otherwise they cannot participate in the, civil, in the civic life of their society. And then I have some examples, I'm going to skip them because of time, but there, is some rec there are some best case examples from around the world where women have partnered with local organizations to help plan urban areas that are female friendly. Um, Housing, I really want to stress, is one of the most fundamental aspects of city planning because housing is fundamental to family life. H housing is very important for positive child development and also for the health of all individuals. However, I want to point out that just in the last five years, the prices of housing have basically doubled around the world. And housing, instead of being available and thought of for families, has become really an economic enterprise. Even in very low income contexts around the world, developers are buying up land and they're turning it into resorts, hotels, they're keeping it for investment, and we've moved away from the concept of housing being a fundamental need that, that is a human right for all. And I think it's incredibly important that we spend some time talking about this and uh, forcing states basically to redesign laws and policies that, that highlight the need that individuals have for housing specifically. Um, in terms of participation, like I mentioned, especially for vulnerable individuals and youth, uh, elderly persons, people with disabilities, women, it is very important that they are included in the planning, management, and also monitoring of the processes in urban areas. That ensures a type of social integration and social stability. Also, it, there is a large need for green areas in urban areas in terms of, again, uh, green areas are good for health, for child development. It leads to an interest in sustainability and in uh, positive youth development. I think we are at an optimal point in our human time because we are at this sort of in the middle of this phenomenon called globalization, despite the nationalistic tendencies that we are seeing around the world. Globalization. Okay, I'm finishing up, uh, it has to do with interconnectedness and it allows us to have dialogues like what it is that we are having today and it allows us to partner on different levels. I have a little list here of different things that I suggest that we could do, but I think especially private po uh, public partnerships and partnerships between different stakeholders, including academics, transnational organizations and uh, local community organizations are absolutely key to ensuring the success of the SDGs and especially SDG 11. I would like to end with the following statement. Without centering families and their vital functions at the forefront of every nation state's agenda, the SDGs will not be implemented in the holistic, integrated manner with which they were conceived. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bahira. And we now go to something that we wanted, we really wanted to have today in our event, which are some regional and local experiences. Uh, I know there is short time, and I would ask you to be as short as possible too, because of, but I, I think it will be very, very interesting to know uh, what you have to say. And we'll start with uh, Mr. Hyrel Fatli Akir, Deputy General Director of the National Population and Family Development Board of Malaysia. You have the word. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Ignatius. <clears throat> Distinguished moderator of this session, Mr. Ignatius uh, Socias, Director of Communication and International Relations, International Federation for Family Development, Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, I will be presenting Malaysia experiences under the same topic as presented by distinguished keynote speakers. Malaysia is a multi-ethnic country with a population of 32.8 million. Family institutions in Malaysia consisted of 7.2 million households. 
with an average of 4.2 members. The number of extended family is decreasing, where from the total household in Malaysia in 2010, only 18% are extended family. In tandem with transformation of Malaysia economy from agriculture and community-based economy to a diversified modern economy, urbanization level has increased from 25% in 1970 to about 75% today. The family trends are fast changing with the emerging of new type of family making today's family institution facing greater challenges. With smaller family size and increasing number of nuclear families living in urban area, in addition to urban poverty issue, all these need to be addressed in order to achieve sustainable cities for family. Moreover, with an, ever, with an ever increasing proportion of elderly population, today's family are being pressured in providing ample multi-generation family support, or we call it sandwich family. The government of Malaysia acknowledged the need for explicit family policy to supplement the existing national social policy, whereby the national family policy with specific plan of action has been introduced for a time frame from 2010 until 2020. National family policy will address the need for prioritizing family perspective in all social economic development. There are three trusts governing the plan of action with regard to first, commitment to prioritize family, second, law and regulation from family perspective, and third, accessibility family friendly facilities. We would like to highlight three driving initiatives under the National Family Policy Plan of Action that contributing to sustainable development goal, especially goal 11. We have introduced the measurable concept of family well-being based on Malaysian family perspective through research done in 2011. There are eight domains related to family well-being in that where two of the indicators related to SDG 11. Through this set of 23 indicators, intervention will be made with more focus on the low indicators. We are in the midst of executing the third study next year to monitor the progress of family well-being in Malaysia. The second highlight is a community-based intervention program named Family and Community Empowerment, acronymized as FACE. FACE applied family well-being indicators to selected communities as experimental study to enhance the family well-being in the communities. The existing social mechanism in the community, for example, the resident association, community, leader, community leaders and prominent volunteers will be empowered as family champion in the community who are responsible to facilitate intervention activities related to each eight domains. The third highlight is the need for evaluation on the impact of policy and program to the family where Malaysia is formulating a manual and conducting study on family impact assessment. Learning from the experience of several countries who have implemented the initiative. Malaysia has formulated a new national urbanization policy for 2016 until 2026 and incorporating the commitment of new urban agenda to ensure sustainable communities in, the, in its national policies and development plan. The government commitment would provide positive impact to the family through involvement of family, community, private and public partnership. The Malaysia National Urbanization Policy Principles involve the community as major stakeholders in town planning as providing, as, and also providing affordable housing, eliminate urban poverty through entrepreneurship and job matching program enhancing the efficiency and affordability of public transport, inculcate 3R practice and better waste management become the main agenda to create a resilient and sustainable family in the urban settlements. Moreover, Malaysia new government is determined to strengthen the role and powers of the local authorities so that the people get the best services more quickly. Local civil society organizations will be given platform to express their view directly in the local authority as SDG 2030 will be used as the benchmark to, 
improve the local authorities nationwide. Evaluating the impact of new policy or program before being implemented is crucially important to estimate the negative or positive impact of the policy or program to the family. In the 11 Malaysian Development Plan of 2016 to 2020, we desired to implement family impact assessment checklist through the appointment of family focal point in each ministries. Henceforward, training on sub subject matter experts and manual as well checklists are in the pipeline and study is also going to be taken to ensure family perspective are being prioritised in the national development agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we all now realise that Malaysia is doing a lot for families. Uh, I was mentioning this morning that I attended a conference in Doha last week, and there were some representatives from Malaysia who were telling us in detail all these uh, movements they've been doing to trying to put family in the right place, and we think it's really great. Because of that also, as you know, we, we gave Malaysia the, our IFFD award uh, two years ago. So thank you very much. And there will be a very nice presentation together with everything else uh, in the website. You will receive, if you register with your email, we will make sure that you get all the materials and presentations. Because I think that will be very interesting for you to, to get to know it better. And now we move to the oldest city in France, Marseille. Uh, that, as you are probably aware, have had many, uh, I would say, challenges more than problems in the past. And has been able to fulfill a really successful uh, policy in many ways. So I think, of course, we would need much more time to, to know in detail, but at least this can be the way, if someone is not interested yet in Marseille, to get that interest. For that, we have with us the Deputy Mayor of the City of Marseille, who's also President of the European Local Inclusion and Social Action Network, Ellison, and let me ask her to tell us uh, about the policies. You have the floor. Merci, Ignacio. Je vais pas spécialement vous parler de Marseille aujourd'hui parce que. I'm not going to talk too specifically about Marseille today because the president of the department will be able to do that better than I can. But I'm basically going to speak as the president of the Elisan Network. So I would first like to thank all the uh, UN representatives who have greeted us today, welcomed us. I'd also like to the, to, th uh, to, to thank uh, Antonio, Ignacio, all those who have signed the charter, Daniela, who's going to be with us, and my dear Martin. And also I'd like to uh, thank the representatives from Equator, Ecuador and Malaysia, and of course Greece, my dear Georgios, and of course my elected, of, uh, dear elected officials uh, who represent the French delegation. I'm very happy to be present at the UN headquarters today as president of the uh, Edison uh, Social Action Network. This institution has uh, immediately responded favorably to IFFD's approach, uh, thanks to my dear Ignacio. And we were present in Venice in January 2010, 2018 for the elaboration of the declaration and the preparation of the charter, which motivates our presence at the UN. I'm also very proud to be among with Martin Vassal, who is the president of the department of the department of the Bouche du Rhone and of so, and of, of the region of Aix Provence, who, by coming to New York to sign the charter, confirms her engagement concerning uh, social development issues, including equity and uh, the social inclusion of the most vulnerable families, and of course, uh, for senior citizens. More than two-thirds of Europe's population live in urban areas, and Europe is the most urbanized continent in the world. 
cities are places of emergence of problems, but also of their resolutions. They are the laboratory for innovation, individual creativity, as well as collective creativity, and also the environment most conducive to the implementation of measures to reduce the impact of climate change. However, cities are also the focus of issues such as unemployment, segregation, poverty, and insecurity. We, who are first and foremost urban local politicians, need to better understand the challenges that uh, uh, European cities and the rest of the world will face in their diversity in the years to come. This is uh, why we are present here today at the UN uh, headquarters as part of the Inclusive Cities for Sustainable Families and the Venice Declaration. Reflection and action on the future and the development of visions of the cities of tomorrow are of increasing importance at all levels. The future of our cities is crucial to the future of the world. If the Elisa Network has signed this charter, it's because we are convinced that cities must focus on a seemingly contradictory objectives. Uh, which are the preconditions for a uh, sustainable city. This is emphasized by, for example, uh, economic development with the environmentally conscious use of resources and a preference for local the local economy as well as other areas. Because cities must use an integrated approach pulling together education, the environmental issues, communal issues, that we have approved this charter. It is also because this charter allows us to uh, conciliate uh, the regional, uh, regional issues that take into account the needs of the citizens. This will create a community of values and of actions which will lead to the creation of political, of converging political actions with a, sh a concept of government uh, with shared responsibilities by all the signator cities that are signatories to build the future of our cities and of our territories and for the populations that live in these cities. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Mrs. Carriga, and uh, thank you foremost for your work on behalf of this European network, Edison. Thank you very much. Now we're going to watch video if this works. Housing. New technologies. Education. Healthcare. Safety. Affordability. Leisure and tourism. Vulnerable families. So you know how much the president of the Veneto Regio Council, Roberto Ciambetti, has been working for this project and for this event. Unfortunately, he can't be here today because of one of these disasters we're having 
now, and probably you, you are aware that in the Venice, in the Venice region and the Veneto region, there have been all these floodings, even with some losses of human life. So we, I, I take this opportunity to, to show my solidarity to them also. But we need to go on precisely trying to avoid these things in the future. And we, we have here uh, Antonio Francina from the Veneto region, who has worked so hard on this, on this project too, and he'll deliver Mr. Ciambetti's speech. Antonio. Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Ciambetti uh, told me to beg your pardon, but uh, he think that uh, uh, you understand the reason of his absence. And now I'm going to read the speech he wrote for this occasion. First of all, I would like to thank the protagonists of the Venice Declaration, the authors, the university experts, scholars, and professors, and those who have worked to draft this document, starting with Daniela Bass, Ignacio Socias, and all the staff of IFFD, and Elena Curtapassi, without whom this work wouldn't have been possible. At the beginning of the speech, I would like also underline the role of the IFFD even for the future. The IFFD is going to be the guardian and the guarantor of the Venice Declaration, and you can really rely on them. I make you sure. They are a group of very good guys. The Venice Declaration contains keywords, as you saw a few minutes ago, keywords to pave the way for a sustainable and inclusive future that is attentive to the needs of the environment and of all social groups. The first the key words, but to be more precise, is not a key word, is a pillar, is family. The development of the city and these services must start with the family and place the citizens from the most vulnerable to the elderly at the center of their interventions. The test of Venice document is clearly written and awaits now for each city, each territory, to translate its guidelines into concrete policies. The goals we have set are feasible and can be grasped. By signing the declaration, we are committed to this task. The Veneto region will subscribe it and furthermore help to deliver more widely the sustainable development goals at local and regional level by promoting it at the committee of the region, such as at the Forum Cities and Region for Development Cooperation in Brussels, the 4th and 5th February next year, organized jointly by European Commission and the European Committee of the Regions. Of course, the difficulties of the historical moment we are living represent huge challenges, such as the contradiction we face. I must be grateful to Bahira Trask, who spoke a few minutes ago about gentrification, which means the destruction of the social fabric in our cities. This is a contradiction. Another, I mention another case, global hunger, Global hunger in 2017 has returned to growth for the third year in a row, reaching today 821 million persons. On the other hand, we register about 2 billion over white people with 672 million obese adults. Some die of hunger, some eat too much, starvation and obesity. Unbelievable and unbearable. We can support this situation. The present with these contradictory data pushes us to look at the reality 
with authentic and founded pessimism. But the Venice Declaration tells us that an alternative wave is possible, starting from the family and our cities and regions, accepting the circular economy as a model of saving, combating waste with a pact of honesty between producers and consumers. The new sustainable and inclusive city is based on modern technologies, on education and training, on safety, on a circular economy, on the attention to be given to the family as an agent of development with a society responsive to its needs. It is a choice of hope and courage. A North African proverb, I think from Morocco, says that the difference between the desert and the floral garden is not water, it's people. It is up to us to choose between working for the flower garden or facing the abandonment of a desert. The land of many colors, the shadow, it's up to us to choose. And the Venice Declaration and its signatories and the IFFD have chosen the commitment of hope, the will to contribute to, in the common effort to guarantee everyone, starting from the most vulnerable, decent living condition. As the ambassador told us at the very beginning of the event, in Quito Declaration, nobody must be left behind. And we repeat subscribing the Venice Declaration that nobody must be left behind. Thank you. So now from here, we are symbolically uh, proceed to the signature of the Venice Declaration by the three first founding members together with the Veneto region. First one is uh, the Département de bouches du uh, représenté par Martin Vassal. Represented by Martin Vassal, the president of that subregion. Madame Excellency, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, it's um, a great honor for me to be in here today and inside this wonderful uh, building. Uh, it is a prestigious building, a prestigious place, a prestigious institution, and I am fully aware of what exceptional privilege uh, it is done to us, the French delegation, and to me especially. Uh, to be uh, like the representative of France in this occasion, um, and also to represent uh, the local authority, and this is quite brand new, seems to be brand new in the NATO institution, so thank you to let us talk today. The honor of having uh, been designated uh, by, uh, to sign this declaration of inclusive city as an event greater um, meaning when you know that uh, our institution, Metropolitan Institution, Aix-Marseille-Provence, and the Bouches du Rhône, the Council of the Bouches du Rhône, uh, are the heart of the strategy of the inclusive cities. I am deeply committed to improve uh, the quality of life of my fellow citizens. 
as as well as the combat social of inclusion and promote access to the culture and education because there are two things very important also and created uh, jobs and wealth and facilitating human mobility, reducing air pollution and protect our biodiversity. All of these challenges, dear ladies and gentlemen, I tackle them on a daily basis, concrete answers. And I hereby pledge the honor to uh, the principal and ambitious goal of the Venice Declaration. Today, local governments are actually uh, where the most effective decisions are made when it comes to improving the quality of daily life. Through its collective and inclusive approach, the Département des Bouches du Rhône, which I led, has managed to translate good intentions into action. Uh, and today's event is a great opportunity to share with you our experiences and to show the result of our hard work in this sense. I fully share the vision of the former mayor of Denver, uh, Wellington Webb, when he famously uh, said, the 19th century was a century of empires. The 20th century was the century of nation states, and the 21st century will be the century of cities. Around the world, the exponential growth of the city consumes resources and weakens the environment, and which is very significantly degraded, and is going to go again in degradation. From now on, we must shape our territory and urban spaces around the people who live in them. That is exactly the definition of an inclusive city and the area where services and the, the usage of such services and our collective assets and resources are developed to meet the basic needs of the population and to satisfy the inquest uh, for a good living environment. More than ever, innovation in all its form must aim and at serving the people so that our cities and our communities become places fully suited for the human activity, for inclusion and for sharing. I am a president of a sub-region and the metropolitan area that want to play a huge role uh, both in France and on European level. My mission is uh, to leverage our strength in the most effective way possible within clearing identified priority areas. My vision of a modern territory ready for the challenge of our time is a metropolitan area basing uh, with projects and which is completely focused on uh, strategic function like protection and, uh, of the environment, job creation and economic development, transportation and mobility, urban planning, and international status and influence. Such an ambitious goal requires new ways of thinking about our society. And this is be done by offering our people a new social covenant, which is exactly what Jean-Jacques Rousseau has theorized with astonishing foresight in the 18th uh, century. Like you, I believe there is such a thing, a thing to the right moment. It is a good time to act and change. Uh, this is absolutely imperative if we want to remain current and adapt constantly changing world. For my country, that is the moment now. We are now at the turning point in our history, one that will allow us to reach beyond our goal. And the current digital revolution is something I want to tackle head off. I want it to uh, all of the strength and the resources is required so as to serve us as the best possible way at the work and in your, our daily life. And I'm talking specifically um, uh, about the social inclusiveness. Thanks for instance, for Provence uh, Emploi. Uh, it's a platform where the people come and can find a job. 
I'm also talking about uh, my sub-region's ex exceptional investment in digital technologies, um, a domain in which we rank number one in France. We uh, also are very near uh, the young generation, and uh, we, in uh, three years, we give 60, 60, no, 56,000 tablets to the middle class uh, children. Like this, they can be uh, more in, in the term of today of the uh, internet. Uh, we had a very uh, ambitious um, program and this is going to be uh, consultated with the local actor, and which is very important. Local government, businesses, citizens, uh, people working in research, research also are very important to work all together. Let me conclude in telling you something. Nowadays, we are at uh, all of us at a kind of turn in our life. Why? Because climate change are going to push the people uh, to go in the urban uh, cities. Why? Because it's a place where they're going to find food, water, and jobs. So uh, we have to be very aware uh, in the way of um, welcome these people in our urban cities. And we, uh, we want to work also in the field that is to help the people living in the country, uh, like in Africa, to help them to uh, have the opportunity to be and to stay in the place where you are, where they are, and to develop their economic uh, level, which is not the case today. So um, it's, it's not only a problem of local authority, but it's a problem of all together, all the governments. So I think today, uh, it's uh, important for us and we are a big delegation all together to be here because we want to explain to your institution and it's a very good idea to uh, congratulation to make this uh, agreement together because uh, we want to know you, there are states, they take decisions and after there is local authorities, they are just in front of the people and they are the ones who are going to help the people who cannot be helped. Uh, so it's very important to get inside an institution like yours um, the opportunity to the local authority to work. Because I think, in my opinion, it's uh, for the future of our children and we are very proud of this to be here today and to have the opportunity to go on with you on this work so you can, you can Count on us. Because it's, uh, it's a great moment for us to work in responsibility we have. Thanks very much. Merci beaucoup, Madame. Thank you very much, Madame, uh, the President. Uh, um, Mr. Giorgio Siracimidis, on behalf of the Regional Union of Municipalities of Attiki in Greece. Dear friends and colleagues, we live in a time of intense fluidity and rapid changes on multiple levels. Globalization, population movements, with particular reference to my country, the first gateway to refugees in Europe, climate change, for example, the catastrophic fire of 23-24 of July in Mati Attica, under extreme climatic condition that refused to the death of 99 people, demographic and social changes are the new reality in which we are called upon to adapt and develop our actions. In addition, my country is experiencing one of the biggest economic crises in Greek history with multiple consequences, in some cases very extreme. The impact of the economic crisis 
on social cohesion, cohesion was more than obvious. At national level, social solidarity income has established in 2016 as a response to the social needs of household living under condition of extreme poverty. At the local level, the existing services were reformed and new structures emerged to meet the basic needs of the citizens, such as social grocery stores and social pharmacies. The majority of municipalities developed in the field of education structures of social education in order to support students and families with financial difficulties. At the same time, in social exchange structures, mainly operated by volunteers, citizens have to possibil the possibility to receive free or exchange, but also to offer clothing, books, toys, and household items. In the health sector, municipalities have taken important initiatives through social clinics and social pharmacies to cover mainly uninsured citizens. With the middle case poverty, it has to respond to the needs of the entire population through social investment and development programs. Today, social services provided by local authorities are the reference point of the citizen. From basic needs to psychological support, lifelong learning, access and employment, social services are now addressed to all citizens and to all age groups. We must fulfill this challenge in demonstrating how local and regional authorities can play a leading role in designing and implementing effective decentralized social services for the benefit of citizens. Dear friends, as a major and everyday recipient of citizens' requests to strengthen social policy, I think it is important to create the condition for a better cooperation between us in order to improve social action in our country. To this end, the Venice communication is a necessary basis for developing cooperation and adopting common policies. By accepting and implementing the, res the respective actions, each of us can help in creating cities and regions that are sustainable, durable, co coherent and freely to all citizens. Thank you all. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have brought here today the local level. And the local level, as we have already seen, is always facing day-to-day -day challenges and difficulties. Uh, the third signatory is the Comunidad de Madrid in Spain, where I got a phone call from the Director General saying, Ignacio, we had yesterday the highest number of accompanied, uh, unaccompanied minors coming to Madrid in history, 700. So we need to think what to do with them, and I can't go. But instead, he sent a very, very short video, which I'm going to show you now. Excelencias, distinguidos delegados, señoras y señores. En la Comunidad de Madrid, tenemos como objetivo prioritario ser una comunidad que destaque en la defensa de la familia. Creemos que familias fuertes harán posible sociedades modernas e inclusivas. De ahí la necesidad de trabajar activamente en el desarrollo e implementación de políticas destinadas a la familia, pensadas y orientadas a la mejora de su calidad de vida, creando las herramientas necesarias que permitan a las familias afrontar el futuro con seguridad, garantías, esperanza e ilusión. En la Comunidad de Madrid estamos plenamente convencidos de que la familia es el elemento natural para el desarrollo de todos sus miembros, especialmente de los menores, de los adolescentes y de los mayores. Por ello, la institución familiar ha de ser necesariamente respaldada, apoyada y protegida. Atendiendo a estos objetivos, 
que tiene la Comunidad de Madrid, nos adherimos a la firma de la Declaración de Venecia, prestando especial la atención a las políticas relacionadas con la vivienda, con las nuevas tecnologías, con la educación, con la salud, con la seguridad, con el medio ambiente, con el transporte, con el ocio y turismo y prestando especial atención a todas las familias más vulnerables como son las familias numerosas o las familias monoparentales o las familias migrantes. Desgraciadamente, problemas de trabajo de última hora han hecho imposible que hoy esté allí con todos ustedes y tener la oportunidad de compartir este importante evento. Permítame terminar felicitándoles a todos y expresando mis mejores deseos para esta declaración de Venecia. Okay, so now we don't have much time, but we're going to have short statements and maybe some comments or questions. Um, first, I would like to give the floor to the representative of Italy. Thank, thank you very much. Well, I, I, I had a, a very long speech in front of me, but I, I just want to, to make some points because in, in the sake of of the brevity and to give other people the opportunity to intervene. I just want to to say thank you for, for this initiative. We are very proud, we are honored, and uh, I especially would like to thank you the Veneto region. And now we have the name of an Italian city on an important document, so this will always be uh, related to our count, my country, to Italy, and we are very proud of it. Um, um, I also would like also to express my gratitude to the permanent representative and the permanent mission of Ecuador and Malaysia because they allowed us to be here today, which is an important element, and to all the people that are all today here at this event. I just want to make two, a, a very um, short uh, remark, uh, is to say that in Italy we, we consider that the role of the regions, the local authorities, regions, provinces and cities in our system is fundamental. Uh, it's on the ground, it's a local level that we feel the effectiveness, the, the impact of the policies that we set at national level to reach the sustainable uh, development goals. Uh, we call it on sul territorio, on the territory. And this is fundamental. The role of the regions, provinces and cities is fundamental. Our regions, our cities, our provinces have been very responsible, very effective. Uh, we have been uh, experiencing a lot of initiatives in Italy. I remember the Carta di Bologna in 2017. I remember a lot of initiatives carried out also together with civil society like Legambiente, initiatives that can uh, monitor the effects of policies on the ground. Uh, starting from March uh, 2018, with the new guidelines for the uh, sustainable development, the role of local authority has been recognized by the Italian government. And now they are part of the national committee in charge to set forth the policies and the guidelines for the activities and the national interventions uh, at, the local, uh, at, at the global level. Uh, so we believe that the Italian experiences can be a model, a positive model. And we hope that with this declaration, we can spread this model, we can spread the best practices all around the world. And we hope that new cities, new actors, new entities will uh, commit in doing what we are doing now. And Veneto, especially, I'm not saying this because Veneto is here, but we have a report that is ASVIS report, that is a national report on the effect of policies on a national basis. And the ASVIS report mentioned Veneto as one of the best practices in Italy, one, a model of activities in many uh, sectors. So I commend here <laughs> the, the Veneto region, but I commend all the participants to this initiative that can be very, very fruitful and very important for, for the whole global system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I also commend the Veneto region for all the work. Um, we like to have civil society representatives with us all the time, as you know, and I know we have here someone who 
came from Europe to just to participate in this event uh, from Fondazione Milk Antonella Pinsauti. First of all, thank you for this uh, very interesting initiative. I represent today Milk Foundation on Luce, based in Padua, Italy, and uh, that was founded uh, with the aim of supporting frail and vulnerable individuals with every possible solution of intervention. We place individuals at the, the center of our interests and we act as a catalyst for the answers. Developing projects for in the inclusion and the development of a new innovative solution in design and construction of a space and new content processes and delivery channels for services. Milk is born as an instrument of innovation able to provide sustainable responses structured for the new challenges of generative welfare combined with the health innovative solutions. In the Italian social context, Milk Foundation always give support to vulnerable individuals and all the people that are supporting and helping them and that are taking the risk to become vulnerable themselves with special focus on the family, main caregiver. Based on the above, Milk Foundation wants to engage to reach the goals that the IFFD offers, and in particular to do this, Milk Foundation is committed to involving the other third sector stakeholders in achieving those purposes, and to give voice to some categories of citizens, like children, persons with disabilities, older persons, have fewer opportunities to make their voices heard and suffer limitation on autonomy and social practices, and that the current forms of representation of a collective interests are generally delegated to subjects who intercept the needs of the so-called active population. Thank you for listening. We will have like five minutes if someone wants to make a comment or a question before going to the closing remarks. Yes, please. This is always the difficult time where no one <laughs> knows what to do. Okay. Can I reach the microphone? <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all um, for holding this important meeting. Uh, I'm interested in everything having to do. Oh, my name is Joanna Meyer, pardon me. Um, I followed the law of the sea here off and on with the mission of the Dominican Republic. Uh, and I already knew about the issue of plastics in the oceans, uh, but because I'm originally from California and spent many years living in the forest uh, with hippies and very eco-minded people, uh, I became more concerned about uh, the issue of recycling. And I know that if we have better uh, regional recycling and education on recycling, then we can uh, limit a small portion of the plastic that's actually going into the oceans. So I'm wondering if anyone here in the room has any fantastic recycling programs that I should be looking at when I consult with other uh, member states and regions um, besides my homeland. Thank you very much. F feel free to come up to me afterwards. Thanks. Okay. Then that's okay, then I think we're out of time now. We, we will move to our closing remarks. And... Um, you also know, because I've talked to some of them, how important for us it was to get the support of UN DESA, this division with a new name, and particularly from Ms. Daniela Bass, who has been so supportive, as Antonio Francino was saying, from the very beginning of the project. So I, I can't think of anyone else better to conclude this meeting today than her. Thank you. Thank you. This was a smart choice because usually when I'm given a chance to talk, I talk a lot. So closing remarks, it means you have just a couple of minutes. <laughs> good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <laughs> and, and thanks again for, the, for inviting me here, for celebrating together the World the Cities Day, and uh, for uh, you know, being present in a moment so relevant when it comes to signing declaration, Venice. I was born nearby Venice, by the way, so we're cousins somehow. Uh, 
but this is very important for, for what we do at the United Nations, in, and in specific what we do at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, which is a department that is the focal point for the whole United Nations system on, uh, on issues such as family and uh, on social groups such as youth and indigenous persons, persons with disabilities and older persons, et cetera, et cetera, and the family is a combination of all of these together. Now, why are we interested in, in the topic of inclusive and resilient cities for sustainable families? Because, as Ignacio said recently, in order to better align our work as department and as division in this case, to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and its 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we changed our name into a div the Division for Inclusive Social Development. So when we talk about cities, we also have to make sure that inclusion is there. <coughs> inclusion of all the, the members of the family. And cities have also to think of inclusive urban planning. When we do urban planning, it has to be inclusive. And here we have to share our knowledge with so many, from mayors, and mayors will share their knowledge about the meaning of inclusiveness of all citizens, of all ages, and of all abilities in their community, so that they can contribute to the community and make a community not only inclusive, but sustainable. And. Um, we know that there are mega trends uh, today, and you have been discussing them, focusing also about urbanization. We know that more than half of the world's population now lives in urban areas, and by the year 2050, the figure will have risen to 6.5 billion people out of the 9.2 billion people that will, will live by then on planet Earth. Now we are 7 billion and something. There will be 2 billion more of human beings living on this small planet. We have to take care of our planet. We have to make sure that our planet provides us the kind of sustainability we need in terms of good air, food, education, transportation, and well-being. This is one of the things we promote with our division, well-being of people. Um, so. I will try to make it shorter. Um, it is clear, therefore, that um, for cities to grow and develop properly, we have to consider cities in developed countries, in developing countries, and in countries where they have emerging economies. Because to have a healthy society, we also have needed to have a healthy economy. And they can go hand in hand. And we know that. In order to implement the 2030 Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals also in cities, we have to make sure that the various dimensions of life are there when it comes to leading a city. The economic, the social, the environmental, the political, and this is up to mayors and city leaders, and also the cultural one. We have to change our mindset. We have to change the culture in which we handle cities, in which we plan our cities. And let's not forget also today's cities, but we also have villages, and they also need to have the same respect and dignity and inclusiveness and sustainability as the cities. Cities are mega, megalopolis, megalopolis, but we also have to take care of our rural areas. So this is going to be maybe discussed another day because we want to make sure that no, no country and no people are left behind. I would like to thank also to support me and the department and the United Nations. This is our role uh, in this endeavor of making sure that families are properly included when it comes to urban planning, inclusive and sustainable and affordable and usable urban planning. There is, as I said today, I think a huge difference between having access to a place. If I think of me using a, a wheelchair, I might have access to a building, but then if the phone, telephone is too high or uh, 
restrooms are not easily use usable, then the place is accessible, but it is not usable. So we're not including people and we're not allowing everybody to participate in the life of the community. Sorry, close parenthesis. Passion here um, and experience. Um, so I would like, as I said, to thank uh, my colleagues. We have Alberto Padova. He happens also to be born nearby Venice. It's a coincidence. <laughs> Um, who is uh, leading the branch with all the social groups and also uh, family issues. And then we have our um, expert, who everybody knows, Renata, who is uh, sitting there in a, in a very humble way, but actually she is our focal uh, reference person when it comes to families in the division. Uh, I would like just to say that, yes, we do not have much space today in terms of time, but the United Nations could offer some space on the 3rd of December to carry on this conversation because since the last three years, the division I lead, the Division for Inclusive Social Development, organizes every year an event which is called United Cities for All. This year, we have decided to celebrate United Cities for All uh, the 3rd of December, which is the International Day of Persons with Disabilities in the afternoon. Um, and uh, the theme of the day will be empowering persons uh, uh, with the disabilities and ensuring inclusiveness and equality in the morning. In the afternoon, the focus will be about accessible cities for all, smart, inclusive urban planning. And we would like to have as many mayors as possible to participate, hopefully being physically present, Otherwise, to participate in, in, in promoting this uh, discussion through maybe video conference and also sending us videos, very short videos, with good practices about what you have been doing in your cities to show also how not only you are promoting inclusion of everybody, leaving no one behind, but you as mayors and leaders are implementing the 2030 Agenda and its 17 goals. As you know, member states are accountable. And they bring, come back to the United Nations every year and they report about their achievements in implementing the 2030 Agenda and its 17 goals. You, being part of the government and for institutions, can play an amazing role in supporting your countries and your governments in implementing the 2030 Agenda and the 17 Goals. We are here to serve the people at the United Nations, you as city leaders and mayors, and NGOs and anybody who is engaged in this topic are here to serve the people. Multilateralism is very important. We must not forget that sitting here around this table coming from various parts of the world, we are discussing and taking decisions and sharing our knowledge. And this can happen only if we believe and support multilateralism. Please, let's work together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think these final words were not only very encouraging, but also very reaffirming of what we're doing. So thanks very much. And I, I don't want to finish without thanking again the permanent mission of Ecuador, the government of Malaysia, of course, UN Desha, uh, uh, UN Habitat, and all of you for being here today. Thanks very much. As, as I said, this is only the beginning. So bear with us for the future. Thank you. Thank you.